Hi, everyone. I am Serena Hom from The Friends. Uh, welcome to this Friends at Home event sponsored by the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. This is our 88th Friends at Home webinar. Tonight, we'll be talking with the author Mia Manansala about her book, Arsenic and Adobo, a Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery. I am Serena Hom from The Friends, a nonprofit organization raising funds and advocating for our outstanding public library in the beautiful city of Alameda, California. These events are free, but you won't be surprised to learn that we appreciate donations. A little later, you'll see a link for donations in the chat thread. We appreciate any donations, large or small, to support these virtual events and in-person programming conducted by the library. Before we get started, you should know that this is a live webinar. Your microphone and camera have been turned off. So please use the chat to introduce yourself and to ask questions. We'll try to get to all of your questions towards the end of the program. We ask that you make sure that the chat is being used respectfully. This program is being recorded and will be available in a day or two on YouTube. Check out our website at alamedafriends.com for the link. So uh, enough about the mechanics, let's get to this evening's program. The Friends of the Alameda Free Library is thrilled to introduce author Mia Manansala, who will be speaking about her first book in an exciting culinary cozy mystery series full of sharp humor and delectable dishes, arsenic and adobo. This cozy mystery was actually one of the Alameda Free Library's mystery book club favorites in 2022. For those who may not be familiar with the term, cozy mysteries, also referred to as cozies, are a subgenre of crime fiction in which sex and violence occur offstage, the, de the detective is an amateur sleuth, and the crime and detection take place in a small, socially intimate community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mia via her bio. Um, welcome, Mia. Hi. So, hi. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. Um, I'm going to read your bio. <laughs> Uh, Mia P. Manansala uh, is the author of the multi-award winning Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery Series. Mia uses humor and murder to explore aspects of the Filipino diaspora, queerness, and her millennial love for pop culture. Her first book, Arsenic and Adobo, garnered star reviews from Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Shelf Awareness, and has won multiple awards. The New York Times stated, Manansala peppers a narrative with enough red herrings to keep readers from guessing the killer. But the strength of the novel is how family, food, and love intertwine in meaningful and complex ways, which are common themes in her writing. She is the winner of numerous literary awards, most notably the 2022 Anthony Award for Best First Novel and 2022 McCavity Award for Best First Mystery. A lover of all things geeky, Mia Spencer Day's procrastinating playing JRPGs, you'll have to ask her about that later, <laughs> and dating Sims, reading cozy mysteries and diverse romance, and cuddling her dogs, Kumiho and Max Power. Find her on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at npmthewriter, or check out her website, miapmanansala.com. So a quick intro to the book, and we'll jump into our Q&A. Uh, when Lila McCuppagall moves back home to recover from a horrible breakup. Her life seems to be following all the typical rom-com tropes. She's tasked with saving her Tita Rosie's failing restaurant, and she has to deal with a group of matchmaking aunties who shower her with love and judgment. But when a notoriously nasty food critic, who happens to be her ex-boyfriend, drops dead moments after a confrontation with Lila, her life quickly swerves from a Nora Ephron romp to an Agatha Christie case. With the cops treating her like she's the one and only suspect and the shady landlord looking to finally kick the Macapagal family out and sell the storefront, Lila's left with no choice but to conduct her own investigation. Armed with a nosy anti-network, her barista best bud and her trusted dashing, Longanisa, Lila takes on this tasty, twisty case and soon finds her own neck on the chopping block. So with that enticing intro, I'd like to turn it over to Mia to read a passage from the book. Mia, thank you again for being here. All right, thanks for having me. So I'll be reading from Arsenic and Adobe, just like the opening chapter, because um, I feel like it's a good introduction, introduce you to the world and the voice. <clears throat> my name is Lila Makapagal, and my life has become a rom-com cliche. cliche. Not many romantic comedies feature an Asian American lead or dead bodies, but more on that later. But all the hallmarks are there. Girl from an improbably named small town in the Midwest moves to the big city to make a name for herself and find love, check. 
girl achieves these things only for the world to come crashing down when she walks in on her fiance getting down and dirty with their next door neighbors. Yes, plural. Double check. Girl then moves back home in disgrace and finds work reinvigorating her aunt's failing business. Well, now we're up to a hat trick of cliches. And to put the cherry on top, in the trope of all tropes, I even reconnected with my high school sweetheart after moving back to town and discovered the true meaning of Christmas. Okay, so that last part is a joke, but I really did run into my high school sweetheart, Derek Winter, my first love. Too bad he'd age into a ridiculous jerk with a puffed up sense of importance and weird vendetta against my family. Pretty much tried to shut down my aunt's restaurant on a weekly basis. Odd behavior from the guy who'd wanted to marry me right after high school, but what can I say? I had exceptionally bad taste when I was younger. You're dumb when you're 15 and hopped up on hormones. Heck, I'm 25 and still make bad decisions based on those same dumb hormones. Hence me working at my Tita Rosie's restaurant rather than running my own cafe, which is what I've been going to school for before I found out Sam was a cheating scumbag. That was right around the time my aunt sent me a distress signal and here we are. So instead of grinding my own coffee beans or brewing the delightful loose leaf teas I'd sourced for my dream cafe in Chicago, I now spent every morning preparing mugs of Copico 3-in-1 in my hometown of Shady Palms, Illinois, over two hours outside the city. The morning clientele at my tita's restaurant always included a bevy of gossiping aunties, none as loud or nosy as the group of 50-something-year-old women I privately referred to as the calendar crew. Their names were April, May, and June. They weren't related, but all three of them were completely interchangeable, down to their bad perms, love of floral patterns, and need to provide running commentary on my life. It was their due, after all, they were my godmothers. Yes, plural. They bore the important title of Ninang and were my late mother's best friends. They loved and cared about me in their own infuriating way. I brought over their morning plate of pandasal and they descended like a pack of locusts upon the dish of lightly sweetened Filipino bread, spreading the warm rolls with butter and dipping them in their coffee or drizzling them with condensed milk. And like locusts, once they were done devouring one thing, they moved as a pack onto their next victim, me. Lila, why is everything you wear always dark? You look like a bruja. And your hair's always in that ponytail and hat, not sexy. Ay, nako, what is this? You get bigger every time I see you. This last statement, um, accompanied by a firm pinch of my arm fat, was from Ninang April, who always had to have the final say. April always was the cruelest month. I was used to these digs against my appearance. It was how older Asians showed affection. And I could ignore their first two comments. While being told you looked like a witch would bother most people, I considered it a compliment. I loved natural remedies, dark color palettes, and made bewitchingly delicious baked goods. So I'd learned to lead into the Bruja image. Everyone needed a personal brand. As for the purse ball cap, it's not like I wore it as a fashion accessory. I worked in food service, and my families were sticklers for hygiene. It was either a cap or hairnet, which thanks, but no thanks. My weight gain, however, was a sore topic. Bad enough that I'd been eating my feelings and couldn't fit into my old clothes anymore. I didn't need them and their fat phobic comments rubbing it in. Then again, I hadn't been home in almost three years. The recovering Catholic in me recognized that these barbs were just the beginning of the penance they would make me pay for being away for so long. I waved my hand dismissively. I ain't in April. I'm just adjusting to being back home. You know everybody eats home with Tita Rosie is around. The calendar crew all nodded as they helped themselves to the coconut jam and kisang pute or salty white cheese that I'd added to the table. Why do you think we come here all the time? The decor? Ninang May asked, gesturing around at the scuffed tables, mismatched silverware, and appliances from the 80s. Nobody cooks better than your Tita Rosie. A loud ha was the source to Ninang May's comment. We all turned toward the source of this rudeness, and my stomach clenched as I locked eyes with the only man I hated as much as my ex-fiance, Derek Winter. Derek sipped at a travel cup of coffee and tapped his foot in a cartoonish show of impatience. Hey, could I get a table already? My godmothers all clicked their tongues in unison and began whispering furiously in Tagalog as I approached him. I thought I made it very clear you weren't welcome here. His eyes crinkled in amusement, something I used to find so attractive. <clears throat> his charms were wasted on me now. Now, Lila, is that any way to treat a customer? The man behind him asked. My eyes snapped to the newcomer. I hadn't realized Derek was dining with a guest. He'd always eaten alone before. Supposedly, dining solo made it easier for him to focus on the food so he could write his reviews. I figured he just didn't have any friends. And even more surprising than the idea of someone willingly spending time with Derek was his companion. What was Derek doing with our landlord? Mr. Long, what are you doing here? What, a man can't have brunch with his son? He clapped Derek on the shoulder who flinched. I've owned this plaza for a while now, but I've never tried your aunt's cooking. You missed another payment. So after seeing some of Derek's reviews, I figured I'd come see what the problem was, see if I could offer any assistance. I narrowed my eyes at Derek. The problem, huh? 
And since when were these two related? You'd think he would have told me his mom had remarried when we first saw each other again, but I guess this was just another of his little omissions. Derek met my glare with a smirk and gestured toward his favorite table near the window. Honestly, how is it even possible to have a favorite table at a restaurant you allegedly despised? Of course, make yourselves comfortable. I smiled sweetly and added, but no outside food or drinks allowed. Derek rolled his eyes and started toward the door, but Mr. Long intercepted him. Here, son, why don't you finish your drink and I'll put the thermos in the car. I gotta call your mom real quick, so go ahead and order for me. I don't know what any of this food is anyway. I waited till Derek gulped down his drink and handed over the travel cup before hurrying to the kitchen to talk to my aunt and grandmother. Those two coming here together, especially after our latest warning about being behind on rent again, could only mean one thing for us, trouble. So that was the first Excellent. chapter. <laughs> Great, thank you. That is um, so exciting. Oh, sorry, my. And um, yes, so vivid with the characters <laughs> and the setting. So speaking of that, so arsenic and adobo's authenticity comes from these descriptions of Filipino culture and cuisine surrounding a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. What was your inspiration for this book? So there are several things. One is that I've I've loved cozy mysteries for a very long time. My mom uh, is the one who got me into them. So my I've been into mysteries um, ever since I was a kid. So I grew up in a multi generational household, like my protagonist. So I grew up with like my maternal grandparents, my parents, brothers, cousins, aunts. It's kind of like a way station for people who are coming uh, from the Philippines to come and stay. And so because of them, you know, some of the, the media, which are a little bit old, you know, I was that five-year-old watching like Matlock and Perry Mason and Murder, She Wrote, like those kind of shows. My mom introduced me to Nancy Drew, Encyclopedia Brown, and then later on Mary Higgins Clark. So I've been loving mysteries basically my whole life. Um, and then my mom, um, she used to work at Walden Books, and she currently works at a library here in Chicago. Uh, she's a page. She's the person who puts the books on the shelves. And so one day she was like, you know, she was putting a book on the shelf and she was like, huh, chocolate chip cooking murder. What, you know, what's that about? Um, which is the first book in a series by Joanna Fluke, which is her, her popular Hannah Swenson mysteries. And, you know, she messaged me one day. Um, she was like, oh, wow, I found um, a book that combines like the two things we love most, which is like mysteries and food. And so I started buddy reading that series with her. And that was my introduction to not just cozy mysteries, but particularly culinary cozies, like books that center around food and, the, and their mystery. And so I, I read the whole series with her. I started reading dozens and dozens of other cozy mysteries. But the more I read, the less I saw myself in them. You know, like they were fun entertainment, but you know, the characters were supposedly my age, but it never felt right. There was not a ton of diversity. Back when I first started in maybe 2015, it's, it's gotten better now, but at the time. And so I always knew I would want to put my own spin on this genre, uh, th this particular subgenre. Like I always knew like in the back of my head, I wanted to tell a story. But like for the my specific in to how I got the idea for Arsenic, and the book that would become Arsenic and Adobo is, um, my mentor, Kelly Garrett, who is another um, woman of color who writes Amateur Sleuth and, and Cozy Mysteries, we were talking about how a lot of the modern cozies we were reading had a lot of similarities with rom-coms, with romantic comedies. Um, she's the one who brought it up. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking. Like, I, you know, I, I didn't see the connection. And she started to lay it out. You know, it's almost always a woman, um, but usually between, you know, like, late 20s, early 40s, like between that age range from a small town who moves to the city, can't hack it, has to move back home for some reason. You know, they have to like save the family's Christmas tree lot or that, you know, they have like these really, you know, become part of the community and fall in love again. And, you know, she started like listing these similarities and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly, it's <laughs> like, they're like rom-coms with dead bodies, you know? And, and for people who have never, who don't, are not familiar with the term cozy, I refer to them like, they're like their Hallmark movies with dead bodies, basically, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, you know, with that conversation fresh in my mind, I was riding the train to work one day and the first line of the book popped into my head, which is, my name is Lila Makapagal and my life has become a rom-com cliche. So like fully formed with the, t the character name and everything, that line came into my head and I was like, oh, that's a story. You know, so I pulled out my phone, I started writing it in my notes app. And as I wrote it, the second line came up, which is the, you know, not many, not many romantic comedies feature Asian American leads or dead bodies, but more on that later. And so with those two lines, I, I had a voice, right? I had 
um, an entryway into the story. And I started writing the book in 2018 and it got published in 2021. And over like, after like the many, many, many times I like revised and revised that book, those first two lines have stayed exactly the same. Um, no book has ever been that easy for me, <laughs> um, but it, it felt truly inspired when that one, that one happened. Wow, that, that's so fascinating to hear like those two sentences became sort of like the North Star and the voice for this narrative. I mean, I found this book so refreshing to have these multifaceted lead Asian characters particularly in a genre, mystery, that doesn't tend to have a lot of Asian characters. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, so how would you describe the importance of geography in Arsenic and Adobo? So as, you know, protagonist Lila Macapco returns to a small Midwestern town after having lived in Chicago, the small hometown, as you mentioned, it's a hallmark of a cozy. Mm -hmm. But also what commentary, if any, is being made about the Filipino, Asian American experience in a small town setting? So, you know, cozy mysteries, they don't necessarily have to take place in a small town, right? The point is that it has to be a tight-knit community, right? I have a friend who wrote a series that took place in, you know, New York City, which is like, you know, Williamsburg, but it took place in the, the community of Williamsburg. And so when I first started, I thought like, oh, why don't I set it in from Chicago? I'm born and raised here. I lived here almost my entire life, except for a brief uh, stint when I was teaching abroad. Um, you know, I... It's what I love, like, why don't I? But then I wanted to really play around with like the Hallmark idea, you know, having the fun of like a ridiculously named small town. And also I liked it, the fact that it was fictional um, because I knew it would be a series if, you know, if I got lucky enough for it to get picked up. And I wanted the, the flexibility to let it grow and change and to become like what I needed to be. Whereas like if I based it on a real place, it's very rigid. And, you know, heaven forbid I get anything wrong because <laughs> then I would, you know, I would hear about it. Right. Um, and so for me, I also like I wanted to mention like what small towns could be because there is like idea like we're like, I mean, yes, obviously, like Midwestern small towns do tend to be like very white, but there's not only that like, there's gonna be like very vibrant towns. So I based it the I purposely based the the demographics on like uh, like a Chicago suburb, actually. Right. So it's technically not a small town, but it is in its own way because, this, you know, the, the Chicago suburbs are their kind of their own thing. And so it's like, okay, this makes sense that even within like a larger majority white community, like uh, um, demographic, these communities would still kind of, you know, pop up to kind of support each other. Um, and also that's why it's one like Chicago, one has an amazing food scene, but also it's a very segregated city. You know, it, it's a city of neighborhoods. And so I thought it would be an interesting way to kind of see the demographics in a way without being like this is where the these live but like like, like traveling through the restaurants that are featured because the 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 victim was a restaurant critic obviously like you know the first thought is like oh it's the person who killed him was probably somebody he's wronged through his job so the investigation takes her to these various restaurants all which are these very particular cuisines around town so it's like a way of exploring the city through the food um yeah so that that, that like that was my like like those are my reasons like this is why it's a small town this is why it's a fictional small town this is why it's these particular demographics and this is how we're going to explore it i love it totally makes sense and yes i mean definitely even visiting all the different cuisines and the restaurants she was doing for her investigation was also just very very just alive and also very descriptive in terms of those foods too so that's great um aside from lila who's your favorite character from the book so whose art do you enjoy writing the most? So the best friend char uh, character, Adina, Adina Awan, she actually had an entire subplot that I removed um, oh. because it was one of those things where it was starting to overtake the story. And, you know, it, it got to a point where it was like, well, whose story is it now? So, you know, suddenly like with this entire arc happening, it was almost you know, it was almost starting to become Adina's story more than Lila's. Like I was getting more invested in that. And I was like, oh, that's not, <laughs> because that's not who this is about. It was one of those things where sometimes for writers, it is good for us to know these backstories and these things that happen to particular characters because it helps us think, it helps know how they, how they were shaped. It helps us know like how they would naturally react and the decisions they would make, but they don't have to be on the page for the reader. Right. If I know my character well enough, um, 
I am choosing things that feel authentic and real and natural for the character to be doing and saying, and I don't have to put like their entire life story on the page. And so like one of the things that was happening, it was something that happened. So, you know, my character left the town to go to college and she hadn't been back. And like, I think I even said it in here, like at least three years. Um, and so the, the subplot involving Adina was something that happened in those years that she had been gone from the town, right? So it was even before the story even started. So that was like, well, it is tied to what's happening with the investigation, but is it necessary to be on the page for everyone to know? No. Is it good that I know this now? Because now I realize why she's reacting certain ways. Like when I was being judgmental about substance abuse and things like that, like why is she reacting so strongly? Yes, mm -hmm. it makes sense for me to know that. But it, it, was, it was just cluttering up the story. Um, and it was, it was so hard because I really, really liked those pages. They were fun to write. She is a great character, very loyal, very ride or die. She's the one who like does the things that you're afraid to do or say, you know. Um, and so I really loved writing those pages, but I just knew they were not right for the story. Okay. Yes. And I mean, I'm just, uh, I was thinking about all her amazing espresso concoctions and her recipes <laughs> and how alive Adina was for me. So. Um, yeah. So, I mean, even speaking again, more about food. So I love the mouthwatering descriptions of the Filipino food infused through the storylines. So your bio mentions that you like to procrastinate. <laughs> and so are you a home chef as well? And how did you select the specific dishes that were featured in the story? So the thing is like with cooking, like I like to cook for crowds. Like I host, um, I, I host for the holidays because so I'm the only one. So as I mentioned, I was born and raised in the city, but now I currently live in the burbs of my husband. So I have a house for my dogs, but the rest of my family is still in the city. So it's easier for people to come to my house because there's actual parking and space. <laughs> so I host for the holidays and I love to cook for the larger group. Um, like, you know, the whole like food is love thing. Like I really like doing that. Um, it's also just much more fun. Like cooking for like sustenance <laughs> every day is so, so boring. It, yeah. it, it, gets, very, it gets very tedious, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I have to make another healthy. Like I just did that yesterday. Uh, like just today, you know, on Monday, I, I, I thought I was gonna good. I, I meal prepped like a healthy meal that could get me through the entire week. And like today I looked at it and I was like, I don't want this. And I ordered like pho for delivery, you know? <laughs> so the cooking aspect is not really my thing as much. Um, I do enjoy baking because like, you know, it's something you do because you don't have to, right? It's, it's just like, it's just fun. Uh, it's meant to be shared, right? Like I don't need to eat an entire cake. That's meant to be shared with other people. Um, but for the recipes, it depends. So there are some where, um, so like, for, for example, arsenic and adobo was not originally titled arsenic and adobo. I sold the book as love, loss, and lumpia. Lumpia being like a oh. Filipino fried spring roll. And, you know, my editors were like, you know, that's a great title, but it doesn't scream mystery. And especially as a debut, you know, we want people to be able to just like look at a title and know exactly what it is. And I was like, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> like, that's totally fair. I get that. Um, and, you know, they, they suggested a title, which I did not like at all. So I gave them a, I brainstormed a bunch of other titles and they chose Arsenic and Adobo. So I actually revised the book to include more Arsenic <laughs> and, and, and Adobo in it as well. Because the original version, it was like vague poison. Like I didn't really mm -hmm. name what the initial poison was, but like now they're like, oh, perfect. I know what research I have to do to like make this more accurate. And so I removed some lumpia references and added more adobo, and that's why I included that recipe. So sometimes it really is as simple as the title. So like all the titular foods, um, there will be recipes in the back. So like for example, um, luckily I stack my books next to me. So homicide and halo halo. So this takes place in the summertime, and halo halo, as you can see, it's a shaved ice dessert. So you know I was like, it's hot, it's summertime. We're gonna want something refreshing. It should be halo halo. Um, my third book, blackmail and babinka. This takes place around Christmas time. So I chose bibinka, which is a rice cake that is traditionally served around Christmas time. So I'll usually have some sort of theme or seasonal aspect that like I can play off of. I'm like, okay, that's the title. That's how I know what foods I want to include, things like just to make it easier for me. So murder and mamon takes place in the springtime. So I played with a lot of like spring, like, like okay, spring means green. So like, and then, so I played with a lot of things like that. 
I have to be intentional because otherwise I'll just sit there for like, I have my Google doc with like the, <laughs> all the foods that I want to like include is multi pages long. So like, I have to like hone it down to the theme to, to kind of get, um, figure out what foods I want in there and why. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So the like, yes, inclusion of those certain recipes are tied to the seasons of the book. And I, I have to say, I love the alliteration of all the titles <laughs> and the cover art. Um, very interesting too, that arsenic and adobo wasn't the original title, but I definitely see how arsenic definitely lets you know there's a mystery that's going to be involved. So mm -hmm. very fascinating. And, and, and again, a plate of food is a way to express love and connection and it represents rich on like histories and cultures. So I love how this book ties all of that together. Thank you. So actually speaking about the rest of the series. So as book number one, without giving away any spoilers, mm -hmm. how does Arsenic and Adobo set the stage for what's coming next in the Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery series? And if you could tell us a little bit more about the series in general. Sure. So I just, you know, like my quick pitch is like, you know, the Tita Rosie's, Tita means aunt in Tagalog, by the way. So it's aunt, the Aunt Rosie. So the 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 Tita Rosie character is so important to Lila. So she, Lila is an orphan. Her parents died when she was young. So she was raised by her paternal aunt and grandmother. And so, you know, the aunt is one of the most important figures of her life. So like the, the series is not even named after my protagonist. It's named after <laughs> the aunt and her restaurant, which is how important the family and the food is to the series. And so like my pitch is, you know, um, it's a lighthearted, humorous mystery series that centers around a family owned Filipino restaurant in a fictional town outside of Chicago. All right. And so um, the so I originally sold the my first contract was for three books, the first three books in the series. So I have no idea how long the series will go. Right? It's as long as it sells, as long as my editor and my public. Well, that's not my it's more the publishers. Right? It's the money people. As long as the publisher wants to continue it, um, it can get extended. But I, but we have no idea what that is. So it's I, I have to think ahead in mini arcs. So I, you know, when I first signed it, I knew I was gonna get three books, and who knows after that. So I planned a little mini series. So the first book, it's almost like a, it's like a coming of age story. Like it's an adult coming of age. It's the idea of like that many millennials feel, where like you are technically an adult, but are you really? It doesn't feel like that. You know, like. <laughs> You know, um, the 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 milestones, the benchmarks that were known that like that you would get when you're an adult, like having a steady career that you stay at for like 30 years until you retire. Like we don't have that anymore, right? Getting a house. No, we can't do that. We buy too much avocado toast. You know, um, you know, settling down and getting married and having kids, you know, more and more people are really, they don't want kids or they can't afford, you know, so it's all these things where you're like, oh, I'm an adult, but am I? And especially for her, who she had, she had a very strong idea of who she is and what she wanted in life. And then she loses it all and has to kind of like go back home with her tail between her legs, licking her wounds. Um, and she has to like reevaluate her life. Like, who is she now that that initial dream is gone? What does success really mean? Like, what is home? Um, and like, is the place that she left the way that she remembered, you know, because in her head, she's like, oh, I can't, I can't wait. I need to get away. This place has nothing for me. And the people that she left behind are like, maybe you are letting your past perceptions of the place color, like, because of what it is now. And so it's it's her learning that, like, where, where is her place in the world? Um, but it, like, it's really, it's a coming of age that's set that where the driver is, is a murder mystery, right? <laughs> and then the second book, it is... Um, it takes place around a beauty pageant and that one is the second book is a little bit heavier than the first because I do something a little bit unusual usually um the cozy mysteries I mean, my books are technically standalones you could pick up any book read them in any order and you should be able to understand them I don't you know it's not like I, I drop a dead body in book two and I don't solve it until book five right no it's, they're all self-contained <laughs> mysteries but there is an overarching character growth because it's the same protagonist over and so in the second book, Lila is, is dealing with the aftermath of the events in book one. And usually in cozy mysteries, they try to avoid that, right? Because again, you need to be able to pick up from anywhere, but it didn't, it didn't feel right for me. And it didn't feel right for that character to just gloss it over as like, oof, that was wild, huh? All right, another dead body. Like it didn't, 
it wasn't right for the series that I was writing and the, and the books that I was trying. So the, the book two is a little bit heavier. It's dealing with those particular issues. It's dealing with um, unresolved feelings of grief. As I mentioned, her parents are, have passed away. Her mother was a beauty queen from the Philippines who pushed her into pageantry when she was young. So she has these very mixed feelings um, about the beauty pageant life and, and memories of her mother and things like that. So it, the book two deals with that. Book three is a happier book. It's Christmas time. <laughs> She's in a better place. Um, her business is in a better place. Um, and so that one's more about family drama and, uh, and things like that. So, th so there, there's like a little bit mini arc of like her trying to find herself, her being in the middle of transformation and then her landing on her feet. And so um, book three ends where like, it, it would be like a comfortable ending, if it, but I left it open enough for more books. And luckily my contract got extended. So there's another three books. So book four in the series, which is Murder and Mamon actually comes out uh, in two months. It comes out on September 19th. And so that is the beginning of another mini arc, right? So the idea, so this, these first three books are like Lila growing as a human being and coming into her own and figuring out who she is and where she belongs. Book four, now she's a little bit sturdier. She has um, steady relationships. She's in a better place with her family. Um, and now, so it's, it's, it's a different kind of trajectory that she's going on. Wow, that sounds exciting. And I can't wait to keep reading further and further into the series. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you've alluded to it in terms of describing your writing process. Um, but yeah, I would love to know more about um, just, as you mentioned, it's, so you didn't know how many books the series was going to go to, depending on the money people. At the same time, you're also writing so that they are standalone mysteries. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about more about the technical writing process? I know there's a lot of writers usually in the audience. And so mm -hmm. that would be terrific to hear. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there's like there's like pros and cons to this. Like, so it's exciting to be able to dive into a world that I already know, these characters I already know well, and I get to develop them more, right? Like I don't have to start from scratch from each time the way that my friends who write standalones do, or like my romance writer friends where it's the same world, but you know, each book focuses on a different character. So they have to, you know, relearn their protagonist each time. With me, it's like I go in, you know, like I just turned in book five um at the beginning of the month to my editors. So it's like I know my girl Lila by now you know and and there's a comfort there where it's like it's not boring because because I still learn more and more as I write um but I can slip into her head pretty easily but the cons are you know it's it's okay make it the same but different every time mm -hmm. right so how do I write the books that are meant to be standalone so I in, have to reintroduce this character reintroduce this world to someone who might be picking up a later book for the very first time, not having read the others, but still do it in a way that is not boring to someone who's been there since book one, you know, especially like someone like me, like I noticed that because I, um, I'm a binge reader. So when I got into Cozy with me, I, like when I found this, I was like, oh, wow, there's already 10 books in the series. I'm going to check out all 10 books and then read all 10 in a row, you know, um, and which is like a lot of fun, but again, like you do start to know, so it's like, oh, I already know that, you know, it, it gets tedious for the reader. I'm sure it gets tedious for the writer too. So I, I'm very conscious, like, how can I drop you into this world and quickly acclimate, acclimate you as quickly as possible without being redundant, but not like acting as if, you know, someone once, I remember like when I was like starting very early, you know, I like someone like one, a piece of writing advice, people's like, oh, start in media rest, like in the middle of the action, don't do a lot of setup. Um, but I took that a little too literally with one of my first iterations. And one of my critique partners is like, you are writing this as if we know and love these characters. Like, I have no idea who this is. I was like, oh, fair, you know, so like some setup is necessary. So walking that line where I'm not just like, pretend you know who I'm talking about. Like, that doesn't work. I have to introduce them. But not in a way that everyone's just like, oh, let me skip the first 10 pages so I don't have to go through that introduction again. Like, that's the hardest part for me um, as a writer. Um, and also, you know, just because they're cozies, like, there's only so many ways they can really kill someone, you know, because they're, they're not gory, right? You don't go into detail. Anything happens off the end. It's just like, oh, how many ways can I do this 
without it, you know, and also like without getting, to, you know, there's a lot of suspension of disbelief, right? My 25 year old cookie baker solving murders. Okay. But there's only so much that I can do where she just keeps finding dead bodies. So I have to keep rewriting them in the way where like, you don't want to get too meta and like wink at the author. Cause like some people can do that, but I feel it's a little like, ah, that's not quite what I'm writing. So I want to make it where it feels believable enough. where like, again, you know, again, book five, like a fifth body <laughs> in this tiny town, but it's still fresh enough. And the circumstances are different enough. And the reason she gets involved um, are true. So, you know, again, the point of an amateur sleuth and the reason it takes place in a community is it's supposed to feel personal in some way. Like why else, would you put yourself in danger like that, right? So in the first book, she's the main suspect and they already, are, they kind of look at it as like an open and shut case. Like, right, you serve the victim the food, you were heard arguing, you, that's your ex-boyfriend. What more, like what, like what else can you, like, oh, well, okay, fair. Uh, um, you know, in the second book, it is her cousin slash frenemy, you know, her, her lifelong rival. And then, you know, like, she helped her in the first book. Now it's her turn to, you know, like um, the, the cousin helped Lila in the first book. Now it's her turn to help her in the second one. The third one is again, a family member. So each case is intensely personal to her for different reasons. So, I, you know, making sure that the motivations to get involved are true to the character at the very least. Like I would never do it obviously, but if I can like make it seem like, oh yes, naturally this character would do it and here's why. So the, like like um, that's that takes a lot of time setting up to to make it believable. Great, yes. Um, I just find it fascinating to hear how. I mean, when I think about mystery writers, I always think about there's this cork board and there's all these like strings <laughs> attached to post its, and then somehow getting all the way to the end of the series. So it's thanks for sharing that glimpse into your writing. Um, great. So you've got Murder on Malone coming out in September. Um, it sounds like you just mentioned you have a fifth book that you just submitted to your editors. Um, yeah, and, you know, we're, I was also looking at your event calendar. August is a very busy month. You're doing a lot of author speaking series. Um, yeah, what's next for you or what can you share? Um, so, oh, I, it's a good thing I never clean my desk because I have all the things I need right around me. So <laughs> my very first short story. So this is an anthology called Fit for the Gods. It's modern inclusive retellings of Greek mythology. It comes out... Um, August 1st, which is next week, Ooh, time. Yeah, so my very first short story ever is in this and it's not part of the Tita Rosie's Kitchen series. It was very fun being able to stretch my voice a little bit. So because we're reimagining uh, Greek myths, I took on the Furies and I reimagined them as Filipino American siblings running um, a detective agency in Chicago that specializes in family drama and revenge. So it's my take on like the Orestes Electra Furies story. That is really cool. Um, great. And this is coming out August 1st, isn't it? August 1st, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, also just, you know, like maybe taking uh, a couple steps back, just thinking from, you know, what's going on in the world today. What are some current trends in publishing, reading habits, and distribution of library materials concerning you the most? You know, we're hearing obviously about book bans, there's mm -hmm. gatekeeping on who gets their stories told and heard. What thoughts do you have on these trends? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, one of them is, that, so I'm very lucky to be in Chicago. Which, so I think, I believe Illinois was the first state to pass a law against book banning. So our libraries are going to be like, are very against censorship and they, they will not deal with like book banning in schools and things like that, which is great. But it is very clear and very targeted who you know the people are going against it's the erasure of queer identities and you know BIPOC identities and anything that, um that does not fit a particular narrative that they want to push which I find is very very you know especially for people who, who are queer and BIPOC it's like you know or my existence um shouldn't even exist you know like uh, you know just being exposed to queer materials like a danger to kids supposedly um and that's how they will always frame it to make it seem like, oh, we're doing this for the kids. Like, you know, my existence is not a danger to the children. Just being like knowing that I exist um, is not a problem. So there's there is that side of the political side. There's also things are really so you know a lot of talk is about 
marketing spend, the books that get to go big. And, you know, it's one thing. It, so when it comes to a lot of Bob, it's one thing to get published. It's another thing to stay published. And so who continues to get to be published even after maybe, you know, your book doesn't do as well as the publisher hoped, who gets another chance after that? So when my books were released, it was unspoken, but obvious that, so my books were considered an experience. So Arsenic and Adobo was my first published book, but it was not the first book I finished. It's not the first book that got me an agent. It's not the first book I tried to sell. Um, the first book I tried to sell, uh, that, that my agent tried to sell was, um, titled Death Comes to Comic-Con, and it featured a queer Filipino-American millennial solving a murder mystery at a comic book convention. It's how I met my mentor. It's how I got my first agent. Um, it's how I won a lot, a, lot, a lot of the awards from when I was back when I was unpublished were grants that were got, I got based on those and that book. But when it was time to sell it, um, there was a lot of pushback. So people don't realize how many yeses you need for a book to happen, right? It's not enough to just finish the book. It's not enough to get a literary agent. It's not even enough to get an editor who's interested. Um, if you're at a bigger publishing house, that editor has to convince the sales team that you are a good investment, right? Because writing is an art, but publishing is a business. And so sales team, the, the editor has to go to, to what we call acquisitions. And acquisitions are where books go to die. My book made it to acquisitions three times. And every time, the editor, the salespeople were like, she's got a great voice, but no audience. Um, one of them went so far as to say that traditional mystery, which is what I write, um, is for older white women. Nobody will buy her books. Um, she, she should be writing YA instead because that's where diversity is. And so um, I knew they were wrong and I kept on, which is why I kept on writing and I eventually got to publish Arsenic and Adobo. And the reason this got some good reception is because my publisher, Berkeley, realized that they were being very narrow in the books that they were acquiring and who they were marketing to. So my books were part of a brand new thing they call, which is the millennial cozy line. And so my books were an experiment. And so I knew that if my books failed, they would use me as an example of like, oh, see, we tried it. And, you know, nobody wants that. And so there was like that kind of pressure on me, which is a pressure that a lot of marginalized writers feel. Like, oh, you know, we, we hear, like, oh, we already have our Asian fantasy. Oh, we already have our black book. We already have our queer this. And so, you know, we hear, you know, like, you know, it, it sounds like we're being, like, we actually hear these things. Like, they actually write it in our rejections that say stuff like that. And so that kind of pressure to have to be exceptional <laughs> uh, before we can even make it past, you know, the, the starting line, it's, it can be really, really difficult to make it. You know, I've been very lucky, but again, um, writing or just like any creative career is a lot of, you know, good periods and fallow periods. I'm doing okay now, but I've only been published for two years. Will I still be here five years from now, 10 years from now? That remains to be seen because of the way publishing is handling itself and the way that it supports its authors. Yeah, well, I can't imagine the pressure of being sort of the pioneer, as you mentioned, in, in that millennial cozy genre and kind of leading it. And then also just hearing the feedback like, oh, we already have our one example of you know, mm -hmm. a writer of this ethnicity. So we've already checked the box. And so we're moving on. And it just, I'm just curious, like, how did you deal with that pressure? Does that help you or like spur you to get more creative? Or is it also more about like just finding the right home? for your book like or is it a, is it a bit of both like yeah I mean that's so hard being the first mm -hmm. so first of all one of the things I always tell like people when I ask them, like oh like what's like your biggest piece of advice for writers is like find your community right build your community and build it early um so I've been writing since 2015 and you know and because so again so I've been lucky that I have lots of writers people who have read my reading people who believe in me I have my mentor who taught me what publishing was like you know, but if I was someone who had no, I, I didn't know any other writers, I had no idea what publishing was like, and I was receiving rejections saying things like, she has no audience, no one will ever buy her books, you know, that's crushing. And so, but I was lucky enough that I could talk to other writers, right? Because, you know, like my husband's very supportive, but he doesn't know this world, right? My, my family believes in me, 
but they don't know what it's like, right? So being able to talk to other writers who know what you're going through, who know what it's like, and remember to be like, no, they're wrong. Keep writing, keep pushing. Don't let them stop you. It, it's so helpful having that place to to vent and that place to learn. Um, and, you know, like I kind of like jokingly say, but, but like semi-jokingly, but kind of real also like spite is a big driver. Like, again, I knew they were wrong, right? The, the, the divide between what the people at the top think readers want, right? Because all writers are readers. I wrote because I love books right? I read so much and I just wanted to see myself in them too. And I knew they were wrong. I knew that there was an audience for these books if they would just take a chance. And if I stopped writing, they would win, right? Like, that, like it's no skin off their back. If I stop writing, they don't care. I'm right. the one who loses. So just the, having that as motivation kept me going. So inspiring. And thank you so much for writing these, these mysteries. They are really fun and amazing. And I'm learning a lot of, about them. And they're just, yes, showing Filipino culture and just bringing more Asian American awareness to certain characters. And uh, I'm so excited about it. And I've been thrilled to interview you. Thank you. So um, yes, I'd love to open it up to some Q&A from the audience. And so uh, let me see, we've got in the chat. And audience, please go ahead. Now's the time to put in those questions here from Mia. So, okay, yes, the title of the short story book that you mentioned is Fit for the Gods. Um, someone wrote, we have our very own calendar crew, 60-year-old <laughs> schoolmates from Manila. And we thought a super cool title is Death and, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, Dinaguan, Blood Stew. So that's actually the working title for books. So I'm working on books. So another thing people don't know, my books come out relatively quickly between eight to 12 months apart. So my, my, I debuted May, 2021. My second book came out February, 2022. My third book came out October, 2022. And now my fourth book is like the longest in between them, which is a whole 11 months, you know? So I turned in book five and I'm working on book six right now. Um, and that is actually the working title right now, whether it gets accepted or not, because I had to fight a lot. Um, so book five, so books one, two, three, and four, the titles were like really easy. Book five, there was a lot of back and forth between me and my editors who they, they weren't happy with the title. We had to go through multiple iterations. So I'm hoping they like the title for book six, because I think it fits perfectly with the theme. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, it's, so you're using the word death, right? It's not the, yeah. the word that they were like fixated about i don't know too strong um so uh let's see we have a question do you have events planned on a tour or outside of chicago in california outside of chicago in california yes i'm let me see i'm going to, i'm traveling every month so like i'm kind of frazzled right now i'm trying to think i am going to i have an event at a bookstore in wisconsin in october I have, I'm a speaker at a writer's conference in Virginia called the James River Conference, which looks, the, the, the lineup is really good. There, and I'm also, God, I'm going to at least one more place. I'm going to New Orleans for my birthday, but I'm thinking of like, well, you know, why don't I also make it a tax write-off? So I'm trying to do it. So I'm trying to find a good bookstore in New Orleans. If anyone knows that, like, let me know. And... Let's see now. So August, I'm doing two in California. September, I'm mostly staying in Illinois. Yeah, all I can think of is Wisconsin and Virginia and New Orleans, possibly New Orleans, if I could find a place to host. Um, so the problem is, so, you know, it's not like the old days where like publishers actually gave you, like paid for you to go on tour. Um, if I'm doing anything outside of the Chicagoland area, it's because an organ, like an organization of some sort reached out to me and is paying me to go there, right? I don't have, hundreds, possibly thousands, depending on how long it is to fly out there and work for free. So, you know, so like this is my job. Like I need, you know, I need some sort of compensation. So anything I go to is being at least partly subsidized by the organization, you know, because people are like, oh, why don't you go here? Why don't you go there? I'm like, I would love to go there. If you can get someone to invite me, <laughs> you know, that would be great. Okay, and then also, like, just in terms of figuring out where you are on tour, um, I guess we can follow you on your socials or check out your your website as well, too. Yeah, so my social media, so that. all my social media is at MPM The Writer. I have a newsletter that I give out every month where I also do, like, giveaways and things like that. I list all my events there. 
Um, and yes, I'll and I also update my events on my website as well. Okay. And actually, um, I can actually drop that into the chat if it will do right now. So we have another question. Um, this is from Joanna. Hi, Mia. I remember you mentioned a book you wrote about a mystery that took place at Comic Con. Do you think there's ever any chance that we'll see it published? So I'm hoping so. So now that like I have a bit of a track record, um, you know, people, you know, personally look at my sales, they can see that, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent bet, you know, people actually read my books. Um, ha ha to whoever said that I don't have an audience, um, which is one of the great things about publishing. Like, so when I earned out, which means like, I like my, I sold enough to to earn like the the advance that my publisher paid me. It's 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 wonderful to have those like the the Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman moment. Like you know like big mistake, big huge. You know, um, so with the Comic Con book, it means a lot to me. That that book was very very special to me for many reasons, and I like it needs to be completely revised. You know, I was a very different writer. <laughs> you know, 2015 than I am now, and. As much as I love that book, I know that I can make it better. Um, but the only problem is like I need the time to read and revise. Right? Obviously, you know my contracted work comes first, and these and my Tita Rosie books come out so quickly that I can only like kind of really like think and plan and, like bits and pieces here and there. You know, book four is not even out, and I'm already writing book six, right? To give you an idea of like what my what my deadlines are like. Um, but I would love love to eventually go back to that series and. Um, and go back to so you know like it like I had originally planned to her like um that one being more of like a millennial geeky pop culture thing so the first one is like Comic Con the second one is like the world of wrestling and and, and so on and so forth so I do I really have plans for that it's just going to take some time uh, for me to to get to the point where I can like reread the entire thing see what I can salvage and see what new directions I should take with it. Great, thank you. And um, I think we probably have time for like two or three more questions. Uh, we have one from Heather. She writes, "Wow, I'm excited. The series will continue. I believe you said ten. Oh, not ten. Six. Is, that's, six. <laughs> Up to six. Yes. Right. Okay. And um, she, if you want to explore this genre and culture, what what other books would you recommend? Other authors, perhaps, uh, to new readers of cozy mystery." So for cozy, so again, I lean very heavily into like the culinary. So another thing about cozy mysteries, uh, they usually have some sort of hook, right? Like culinary, obviously they center around food, but there's also crafting mysteries, right? So like I like they're like knitting and quilting and scrapbooking, you know, ones. Um, so like uh, my friend Olivia Black, her late the second book in her so she has one that's a, that's a it's a record shop mystery series that takes place in austin texas the second book literally just came out yesterday tuesday so on tuesday two days ago so the olivia black's record shop mysteries um if you really like the so vivian chen and her noodle shop mysteries so those are the ones that i read and i was like yes, there is clearly a place for, for Asian stories in Cozy Mystery. So the Vivian Chen series, um, V.M. Burns writes the series. Where I, I think it was like one of the ultimate, like when you think cozy, this is like so cozy. It's the mystery bookshop series. And so um, it's great because you get two mysteries in one. So in the modern day, it follows a woman who opened up a mystery bookshop after her husband passed away. It was their dream. And now that he's gone, she realizes maybe it's, you know, it's, it's time to, to make good on the, the thing that they had planned on for so long. So she runs this mystery uh, bookshop. And of course, like murder and shenanigans happen that she gets involved in. But on top of being a mystery bookshop owner, she is also an aspiring writer. And she wants, she writes like British historicals. So you get like a modern day American murder mystery, and then also the the British historical murder mystery that she's writing woven in between. And it's just, they're so light and fluffy and fun. And I really, really love them. Um, I mentioned earlier before my, uh, my mentor, Kelly Garrett. So she, her original, her first series with the detective by day. So Hollywood Homicide and Hollywood Ending are the first two books. And now she also writes standalones for like, that are more like domestic suspense. Um, ooh, I could keep on going forever. <laughs> <laughs> great. This one's like great starts. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Well, um, yeah, we've got four minutes to the end of the hour. And I just want to give a big thanks to you, Mia, for such an informative conversation. 
It was fun. And I know I learned an immense amount from the talk and from reading the book. Oh, we do. Oh, and I'm sure our audience has also. We have time for one more question. Uh, Suzanne asks, do you have a go-to karaoke song? Ooh, so that's tough. So in the third book, there's a karaoke scene. So again, I the contract was only for three books. And I was like, I can't have this series end without including a karaoke scene. I had to fight for that scene because my editor was like, ah, oh, you know, the pay, like, is it really what they would be doing right now? So I had to like keep revising it in a way to make to make it so that it like it was a necessary scene because I did not want to remove it at all. Um <laughs> For me, it, it kind of depends on the moment because I'm not going to be the first person to sing. I'm a terrible singer. So it depends on like what mood we're at, right? Like, are we in a, like a super high energy poppy, you know, kind of mood? like, you know, and then like, oh, Backstreet Boys is a very easy, you know, I want it that way. Um, like if it's going like a little bit slower, like, are we going like power ballad slow? Or like anything Celine Dion or, you know, are we going like cheesy 80s where I'm like anything Journey? It, it really depends on the mood. I don't have like one song that I will always sing. It, it depends on the group. It depends on the mood, things like that. That is, that's a great question. And thanks also for answering it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we can't wait to read that scene in book three. So again, yes, um, we're at the end of the hour. So I wanted to thank you again, Mia. This has been terrific. Time flew by, and we've got such an engaged group of uh, an audience here. And so, wonderful. In closing, I want to remind folks that there's a link in the chat, which will take you directly to Books Inc.'s page where you can purchase this cozy mystery book, as well as the others in the Peter Rosie Mystery Series. And I hope this talk has motivated you to do that. And our second adobo is also available at the Alameda Free Library. So um, again, a reminder to consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or through the link posted in the chat. It will help us continue to produce events like this. Also, if you have a friend who misses talk, you can tell them it will be available on YouTube in the next few days. They can check the website for a link. Our next virtual event will be August 16th at 7 p.m. It will be an art docent webinar focused on the art of Robert Feshtel titled, What's So Interesting About Houses and Cars? Museum tour guide Ronnie Paul provides information to help audiences understand the context in which these works are created. Fun fact, painter Robert Bechtel grew up in Alameda. We encourage everyone to attend this latest in our extremely popular museum docent talks. Thanks to our friends at home, and friends at home team that make these events happen, David Beal, Karen Manuel, Karen Romer, Renisha Robinson, Mar Fonts, Karen Butter, Catherine Adcox, Billy Reinschmidt, and TC Curry. And a special thanks to author Mia Manansala for such an informative and entertaining program. Finally, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, lastly, we will have a booth at this weekend's Alameda and Art, Art and Wine Fair, which is Saturday and Sunday. Our booth will be across the street from the Alameda Theater. Come by and say hello. Thanks and good night.